Honor, folks, it's good to see each one of you this morning. And for our opening hymn, it's going to be page 435. This is Memorial Day uh, Sunday. And we will praise the Lord for our spacious sky. Oh, beautiful. We'll all stand. So, um, if you take a look at your bulletin, uh, we have a Memorial Day prayer. For those who courageously laid down their lives for the cause of freedom. May the examples of their sacrifice inspire in us the selfless love of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, you'll also see that uh, a pastor visions 2, 8 through 10. So, uh, I, as a matter of fact, the uh, pastor gave me the whole list of everything that he has coming up for the next, for the next number of weeks. Um, I want to start by asking you all to pray for Donna Knack. I got a call from her Friday evening, and she has caught shingles right underneath oh, her left no. eye. And um, so, she says she's okay. She's already made a doctor's eye doctor's appointment for Tuesday morning. Um, but pray for Donna because you know just how uncomfortable uh, those shingles can be. 
I got a really great note uh, from Kathy Weeks last night. Frank is just doing great. Uh, <laughs> And it's, it's kind of like Donna said, she went to see him and she said she couldn't find him. They said, Frank is all over the place. And he's outside, he, he's doing all sorts of things, but he's getting his strength back. And uh, it's kind of hard to hold him down. So Frank is doing really well. And the really good news is that uh, uh, Shirley has been moved into Hanover Green, which is right over by Regent Memorial. And she just loves it. She says she gets to sit and walk in the gardens, and they even bring me coffee. So, so she is very pleased with the way that's going. Uh, Wanda told us last week that she and Bill would be traveling for their 50th anniversary, so we knew they wouldn't be here today. And I really got a uh, good correspondence back and forth with John Rhodes, and he said, Beth, for the last two weeks, Beth has really been that I've known for more than 40 years. And he's on our prayer list. Uh, that's Bill West. And I've been keeping up with him regularly uh, here for more than the last month or so because his health is declining. And he found out just this week that his heart is only uh, producing at about 32%. Not good. So he has a doctor's appointment on Tuesday uh, to have either a heart procedure or go on hospice. And previously he has said he's not I pray for Bill West if you would. And by the way, the updated prayer lists are on the table in the back. And if you don't have one, uh, please pray on, plan on picking one up as well. Uh, the new uh, birthday and anniversary sheets are out there. And uh, the first one we can again this coming Sunday. Um, but they'll be in for a while. Um, but uh, our granddaughter now has graduated from high school on Saturday. So we'll be down in the Carolinas and uh, celebrating. It's difficult because those who were staying at home now don't want to come back to school. And same thing is happening with my daughter in a situation of her work. She goes to work the other day and she's in a huge, huge, huge office building and she said there was seven cars in the parking lot. So once you get accustomed to staying home, you kind of don't want to come back. Uh, but what they're doing is classes this year. And for all the local folks, the ones that live nearby, they are requiring them to attend classes in person. But he said also it's a blessing for the ones that are not close by that their outreach to the college uh, renovation in January. We're so thrilled that the progress uh, that is going on at this point. We're hoping to be able to finish the first phase of the renovations with the money that we have on hand. It remains to be seen if we'll be able to do any work. What they're running into is so much of what you're seeing and hearing everywhere else is that the cost of increase for all the materials and labor and everything related to the project is really going sky high. And they're finding out they're having to do more code required if you put anything towards a special project. And he says, so thank you for your prayerful support for without that, our ministry would be impossible. Your co-laborers in Christ, Howard Field, Larry, and Caitlin. And uh, this morning, um, we talked to Buddy, and Buddy said that he is more than happy to pray, but he just doesn't feel like he ought to be the one to do the praying all the time. So this morning, we've asked uh, Brother Jim uh, if he wouldn't mind leading us uh, in our prayer. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Following Buddy is a tough act, so please show me mercy and grace, please. <laughs> this week, um, I, we get a Bible verse every day on the computer, probably as many of you do. And interestingly enough, God's timing is remarkable, to say the least. Um, the verse that I read comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, and it reads, 
I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Let us pray. Dear God, we bow before you today very humbly. And Lord, we just can't thank you enough to where you have brought us um, during this time of our church life, Lord. And as we go through looking for a pastor, Lord, we see you working. We, mm -hmm. we saw it right from the very beginning, Lord. And if you take a step back and you look, and Lord, we just praise you so much for that. We, we, um, you have brought us Matt and, and Lord, what he's going through, I can't imagine. And Lord, he's right here, Lord. He's honoring you. He's, you called him to be here, and he's here, Lord, and I praise you for that. And Lord, he's just leading us through this, and, and it's just awesome, Lord. It's going seamless. And Lord, and, and our committee, Lord, they are just seeking your guidance, as we all are as we are united to pray for one another to whatever situation comes up. And Lord, this one is just hugely important. And we just thank you for being right with us. And we thank you for loving us, Lord, when you didn't love when we didn't love you. And this is another prime example of, of how your timing is always perfect, Lord. And and we just thank you so much for the opportunities that are come that come from this. We just thank you for the growth of each of us as we go through these times, knowing and having the confidence that you're behind us and you will give us the strength to do what it takes to get your will accomplished in this church, Lord. And, and it is in your word that through bad times, good things come out of it. And so, Lord, we, we know once we get to the end, good things will have happened and, and Brown of Baptist Church will have good things in front of it to enjoy in your name. And Lord, we just like to continue to ask, and I know speaking of Donna Ernest earlier, earlier, dear God, how she wanted to put our church and the committee on the prayer list, the weekly prayer list. And she, she just stressed that fervent prayer is so important and she's exactly right. And we just, uh, we just continue to do that and Lord, Pastor Matt made a request that um, during the lunch hour, Lord, what, whenever we eat lunch, that we can pray together, Lord, even though we're not together. And so, Lord, I'd just like to continue to remind people that during your lunch hour, Lord, help us all to lift up this situation, our church, and our whatever comes to mind, Lord. We just would like to give it up for you. You already know the situations, and we know that your will will be done, and we're thankful for that. And we take peace in your will, Lord. We know that you know what is best, and so we praise you for that. So, Lord, it's already been a good day in this church, and we just ask that you be with Brother Matt as he delivers your message. And may all that we do say and think this day and going forward always be pleasing in your sight. And it's through your son, Jesus, that we offer this prayer. Amen. Amen, amen. Let's <coughs> turn into our handles for page 172. And let's all stand. When we sing this song, let's listen to the words. Put them in our hearts. And I think you'll see the resemblance of everything that's being taught today.
here on a dreary, rainy day. And just to liven things up, if you would look to the person on your left and on your right and tell them, you look good today. <laughs> no, I'm not quite good today. <laughs> How many of you lied? I'd ask for you to turn with me this morning to Romans chapter 8, beginning a series on uh, basic Bible doctrines. Uh, the series title is The Power of God for Salvation, Everyone Who Believes. Uh, we, we tend to hold mythical views of heroes of the faith like Abraham, Moses, and David. Uh, we know that they had their weaknesses. You know, Abraham slept around. Moses had a temper. Uh, David was a murderer. <clears throat> and yet we, we still hold him in high esteem, thinking that we'll never be able to have that kind of faith. Uh, why do we put these people on pedestals? Uh, a TV program called Pros vs. Joes, uh, you might have seen it years ago, pitted professional athletes against ordinary guys. Uh, and the pros do what they do so well, you know, when you're watching a pro football team or a baseball team, they do things so well that it's hard to imagine how, how well they do it because they make it look so easy. Uh, so ordinary people see this and think they can do just as well, and, and on the show, the pros made the ordinary people look really bad. Uh, you would laugh at the audacity of these ordinary people because they thought that they could match athletic skills with professionals. And, and we, we watched that show realizing that never, never in a million years will we be able to be like Mike. Remember the commercials for that, be like Mike? You were content with that. I'm, I'm good. I'm fine that I'm not as good a basketball player as Michael Jordan. Uh, we know we can't be that good, so guess what? We don't even try. It might be fair to say that we lionize these heroes of the Bible in order to excuse our own weak faith and lack of service for Christ. Uh, for whatever reason, we put these heroes on, on a, a plane higher than ourselves, and since we can't be like them, we don't need to try. And then we wonder why we have an anemic faith. Mm. Did you ever stop to think that Peter and John were just ordinary, salt-of-the-earth people? They were blue-collar workers. Uh, they knew what it was like to put in a hard day's labor. Uh, they knew what it was like to live from paycheck to paycheck, uh, as we might say today. That they weren't scholars with seminary training. They were everyday people. And, and God did incredible things for them and made incredible blessings through them. And we may experience similar things, but only in the same way as these great people. We may have them only by faith. Try as we might, we can't make these blessings happen. There are promises that are, that are too big for us to make them to happen. Let me, let me rephrase that in light of current political terms. The promises of God are too big to fail. When God saves a person by grace through faith in Jesus alone, he doesn't just make that person want to own a Bible and want to go to church on Sunday. True. The work of redemption means great things for us, which impacts how we live. The facts uh, that we read in Romans chapter 1, we're not ashamed or embarrassed happened to us. We don't regret that we were saved. And though believers know the right facts about the, the, their salvation, they may not always understand how those facts impact their daily lives. They're content to muddle through life when the, when the storms of life come. It's great to have prayer and a lot of attention from people in the pew in front of you and in back of you. Uh, but when the crisis is passed, there seems to be little growth. Additionally, for many believers, salvation changes what happens when we die. It doesn't really change them on a daily basis. And for such believers, ch uh, salvation changed their destination, but not their disposition. True. So over the next several weeks, we're going to examine aspects of our salvation and what they mean for our lives right now. How we live them when we walk out the doors of this building. How we live them inside the doors of this building. And we will discover wonderful truths that, that by grace will empower us to live for Christ 
in a way that pleases him in all things. So we're looking here at the first doctrine we're going to consider today, and that is predestination. Let me get my tablet to start working here. It went to sleep on me. Technology's great when it works. The main character in a, a well-known movie stands before the grave of his beloved wife, trying to make sense of their lives and her death. And he reflects, saying, I don't know if we each have a destiny, or if we're all just floating around accidental-like on a breeze. But I think maybe it's both. Maybe both is happening at the same time. It's an intriguing thought. How should we understand our lives? At some point or another, we've all asked ourselves the question, what's the point of my life? Sometimes that, that question comes across as an emotion uh, rather than a rationalization. I mean, how many times have you gone to the store and come home or maybe come home from work and, and, and you, you think, have I lost my mind? I mean, I feel like I just spent the entire last several hours just beating my head against the wall. You ever feel like that sometimes? You know, what is our life's purpose? And our study of the doctrines of salvation begins here with predestination. I'll explain it more in a few minutes, but at the risk of oversimplification, predestination basically means that God already planned everything that happens. Mm. Now, some think of predestination as a fatalism in which everything is already unbendingly predetermined. Applying this view to salvation, salvation becomes like a uh, God say on a, at the risk of being trite, and I don't want to, to cast down on those who, who believe differently than we do. So I, I, I hope it doesn't come across that way with this illustration. But it's like God's on an elementary school playground saying, I pick you, you, and you. And, and, and this view of predestination suggests that God looks down the hallway of time. He knows who will believe and who won't, but that belief is not up to them. And, and God makes his choice based on that foreknowledge. We could liken another view of this in terms of Sesame Street. Uh, we're all puppets being uh, operated by unseen hands. And we're all marionettes being tugged and pulled and manipulated along life's way. And the hands and the strings are there, but you just can't see them, and you can't do anything to stop it. And consequently, we don't really have any choices because God already predetermined the future. In both views, God tends to be this impersonal and aloof God. He's not really interested in your life. He sits in heaven looking down in, in morbid fascination, entertained by our foibles and failures. And neither is the case. Predestination is more like a person sitting down to, to plan a vacation. You decide where you want to go and what you want to do. You know, did, when you plan your, your vacation, are you like, oh man, I've got to plan my vacation now. This is the worst thing in the world. No, you enjoy doing it. God determined in eternity past that, that salvation would be offered in a specific way and, 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 and how it works its way into everyday life. And understanding predestination helps us to understand how we can live our Christianity in real and practical ways every day. But to hear many preachers today, you would think that Jesus died to make much of us. And through caricature and teaching about our royalty as believers and, and by use of verses that are just wrenched out of context, one would think that believers, not Christ, are the end-all, be-all of salvation. And through sermons full of aphorisms and therapeutic moralism and psychological pablum about perceived needs, American Christianity became a better way to be a better spouse, a better co-worker, a better way to get the things we have, a better way to diet, uh, a better way just to feel better about ourselves. And such religion becomes this reverse legalism. I'm better than other Christians because I don't have these strict rules in my church. It's just a repackaged form of legalism found in one of Jesus' parables. A religious leader stood next to a tax collector praying, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like he is. And this self-centered kind of Christianity becomes a list of facts and how-tos, how -tos, humanistic morality by which they compare themselves favorably others. And God becomes the symbol of morality rather than a savior from immorality. True. And this kind of Christianity leaves the impression that our lifestyles don't really matter. The logical conclusion must necessarily be that nothing we do matters. And where is the hope in that? 
doctrine of predestination strips us of ourselves. It places our agendas under God's. It, it tells us that God has a specific purpose for us. And everything we are and do must conform to that purpose. God's predestined purpose for you is that you would be like Jesus, mm -hmm. doing good wherever you go. Mm -hmm. Life goes drastically wrong when we depart from God's purpose for us. We depart from God's purpose because we believe our way is better than God's. We wouldn't say it that way. I, I believe most, if not all Christians, would say that God's ways are good, but say their ways better based on experience or opinion, which trumps God's word. When we live as God called us to live, we show that we love and trust a God whose wise love for us focuses everything for our best. Mm. And so let our prayer be this. I'll pursue God's purpose for my life. I'll pursue God's purpose for my life. There's many passages we could go to look there. In fact, I'll be departing from my usual expository preaching here, uh, I guess is, I won't be expository to some degree, this is more thematic or topical in its nature. We can look at several different passages, but we'll look at two in particular here. The first here is in Romans chapter 8, where we find that God's will is that I would be like Jesus. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. When we talk about God's will, we mean the practical aspect of, of predestination. Uh, to will something is to make a choice, to determine a specific method or goal. For example, when we pull out a map, we, we want to find out what roads we need to take to find the best route. And then we decide which vehicle we will take. Uh, will we take the bigger car with more room, uh, more comfortable, or will we take the smaller one that gets the ga better gas mileage? And we set a goal and a way to get to it. Now God's will, his choice regarding the method or goal of his plans, is expressed clearly here in this passage. God's purpose is, in a believer's life is that everything works together for good. Now let's make sure we understand what exactly this verse says. First of all, it says all things. There's nothing. And I repeat, nothing that happens in our lives that God cannot use or overrule it to work according to his purpose. True. Nothing. Think about Joseph for a moment. We talked about this real briefly last week in, in the message. Uh, Joseph's brothers plotted to kill him, but decided instead to sell him into slavery. The top general of the world's most powerful military army bought him. Joseph's excellent attitude caught his attention, and he was promoted to top slave in the general's house. The general trusted him with absolutely every aspect of his life. And when the general's wife tried to seduce him, he refused and was falsely accused of sexual harassment, and Joseph was thrown into jail. He waited for two years before a seemingly chance encounter with the pharaoh's butler, who introduced Joseph to the Pharaoh. And after that introduction, Pharaoh made Joseph the second most powerful man in the world. Being betrayed by your brothers is a horrible thing, is it not? You would have, you'd have to be off your rocker to say it was good. It was, but it was the only way that Joseph could be in a position later to be able to save his entire family from a great famine so that God's plans for Abraham's descendants would come to pass. Joseph's choice to do right and to maintain integrity never seemed to pay out for him, did it? People along the way make deliberate choices, choices that radically transformed his life. And God had a purpose for the nation of Israel, and he overruled hateful and spiteful choices and actions so that his plan would remain true and faithful. Both the best and the worst things that can happen to you fall under God's sovereignty. He isn't surprised when a person is injured or dies in a car wreck. Mm -hmm. He doesn't step back in shock and horror when the doctor says you have an incurable disease. Mm -hmm. He doesn't shake his head in disbelieving amazement when you suddenly get this windfall, financial windfall. Uh, he makes all things work together for good. True. I note something else in particular. The verse says, for good. 
We, we read this verse and we unconsciously insert the word your, for your good. This may be the case, but not necessarily. Joseph went through a pit and a prison, and God made it work well for him. But Joseph's success was not God's primary purpose. God's first purpose was to save a nation and then an individual. This means that he uses us to impact others because he works through people. That suffering or that success that we experience isn't only for us. That success and failures of others aren't only theirs. God uses these times to work in a multitude of ways. One pastor says it this way, quote, if we could see what God could see, which we never will, because we will never be infinite, you would see millions upon millions of purposes in every action of the Son of God. God is never doing just one thing in what he does with us. He is always doing thousands of things that we cannot see. He never has only one purpose in what he does. He always has thousands of purposes in everything he does. And he is infinitely wise, and everything he does relates to everything else that he does sooner or later. For those who love him and are called according to his purpose, all of them, all of them, work together for good. There's one more aspect of this verse that's crucial. Notice that word good. What is good? What you think is good might be something that I, I don't like, and, and vice versa. I absolutely hate canned peas. <laughs> if, if you invited me to your house for dinner, I would eat whatever you put in front of me except for canned peas. <laughs> uh, I, I, just can't do it. I don't know why. I just, I just can't. I had a friend. I, I love chocolate chip cookies. Uh, that, that, that was manna in the book of Exodus. I'm not convinced of that. <laughs> I had a friend who could not stand chocolate because of the Miss Fingers message. What I like and what you like, what you think is good and what I think is good may not always be the same. Some think that good is a sudden and unexpected provision. When, when we first learned that Lee had cancer, uh, aspects of her treatment were already being provided. But we didn't know it at the time. And, and God providentially guided us so that the resources were already there when we needed them. In the end, those things worked out well. Good is not that everything is back to normal and certain needs are met in unusual or unexpected ways. If that's what we call good, Something that starts out bad but works out better than we expected in the end. We embrace a prosperity gospel where God only does happy things for us. We've created our own gospel. True. Some think of good as maybe success or something tangible like that. Jimmy Johnson was the football coach of the University of Miami. He experienced great success and he caught, caught the attention of NFL teams and he went to the NFL team uh, as a coach and experienced great success there too, but his success cost him dearly. It cost him his family, something he openly admitted as his greatest regret. Success and money and fame aren't as good as we think they are. Good must be something that, that isn't temporary or arbitrary or subjective as whether we like canned peas or not or whether we get a raise at work. What is good? God doesn't allow us to guess or to decide what is good. Given a choice, few, if any of us, would choose unpleasant things and difficulty and pain. Yet we all experience it at some time or another. Does it mean that God isn't good when I suffer? Mm -hmm. Good in verse 28 must mean some, uh, sometimes gut-wrenching difficulty, excruciating pain. In fact, if you looked at verses 38 and 39, we, got, we find that God allows all kinds of things into our lives very few of which anyone in their right mind would call good. Things we would never in a million years guess would be good for us happen to us. Who decides what is good? God determines. He predestines what is good. Look at verse 29. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. What is that good? To be conformed image of his son. The good in verse 28 is becoming like Jesus in verse 29. God uses everything in the believer's life to 
make him or her like the person he loves the most. Right. His own son, Jesus Christ. Right. It, doesn't ha it didn't happen quite like this, and I don't intend what followed to be trite. But imagine it this way to help you to understand predestination. Before creation, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit sat at a conference table to determine the plan of salvation. And as they talked, they decided in perfect harmony, not a fraction of a second of disagreement, that those who believe on Jesus for salvation would be saved. Well, what then? What does salvation look like? What's the purpose of redemption? And with all consumingly satisfying joy, Knowing that he would give his son as the sacrifice for salvation, the father said, those who believe will become like Jesus, the son. The son said, I absolutely love you, father. I will go and I will die on the cross. And the spirit wholeheartedly agreed and said, I will empower him to do what he needs to do. That's what predestination means for the believer. Now, these aren't just cold, hard theological facts. This means that everything that happens in your life is for your best. The conductor in an orchestra brings the many musicians and instruments into harmony to produce a beautiful performance. And God orchestrates your life so that it interacts with, with the lives of countless people around you. And as that happens, you will become everything. All wise, all powerful love, God orchestrates the events of our lives so that we become just like Jesus. Now, what does becoming like Jesus look like in everyday life? If you would flip in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Very familiar passage to many of you. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 8, we see that God's will is that I will do good. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and following. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The Apostle Paul teaches us here about the glory of salvation. When mankind fell under the curse in the Garden of Eden, God did not have to redeem us. Uh, he was not obligated for any reason outside of himself to save us. Uh, he decided to do so as an act of free grace or independent grace. If, if grace is not independently exercised, it's not grace. We talked about this a few weeks ago. It's just a business transaction in which one person owes someone else something. As the greatest being that exists, God owes no one anything. And by faith, we believe that truth, and we believe that salvation is a work of God, not of ourselves. The only contribution we make to our salvation is the sin which nailed Jesus to the cross. We have no reason to boast that we deserve anything from God. True. Again, if we were deserving, then God would owe, owe salvation to us. But he saved us so that we would be like his son. Think about his life and ministry here on earth. In Acts 10, the apostle Peter preached about Jesus saying, he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Jesus did countless good works. But look at what was most important about them. It wasn't the works. It was at the end of the verse. God was with him. When God designed the plan of salvation. He didn't create this, this uh, our lives to be like a reality TV show in which people do impossibly bizarre things. You know, you've seen these things. You laugh at how insane these these mind-numbing, impossible things that they have to do to get, you know, a million dollars or whatever. God designed salvation to be a real-life matter. The greatest proof of our salvation is that it works its way into our good works. James tells us that faith without works is as useful as roadkill. There's a lot of talk about corruption today in government. What, what's political corruption? It's using one's office to serve one's own self-serving wants. Yeah. Our good works aren't for us. Christianity isn't about us getting whatever it is we want out of life apart from Christ. Mm -hmm. That's corruption. Note how God refers to us in verse 10. Ephesians 2.10. He calls us his workmanship. 
you looked at a Bible concordance, you'd find the Greek, sor uh, the Greek word is the source of our English word poem. And what's a poem? It, it's a work of fine art in the area of literature. The Mona Lisa is a masterpiece of painting. The Venus de Milo is a masterpiece in the realm of sculptures. Spiritually, you and I and every believer are God's masterpieces. We were created to display his glory by doing why is this important? The Bible teaches clearly that a believer cannot separate faith and works. God predestined, he chose that all who are believers would do good works. Good works are, are the evidence of our salvation. There's no such thing as a Christian who does not give evidence of his or her salvation. There's no such thing as a closet Christian. A true believer shows his or her salvation this brings us to an important question. What are the good works? What, what are the works of faith? Well, these good works aren't necessarily good deeds. They may include it, but not necessarily. For example, good works aren't, aren't necessarily holding the door for someone and, or picking up something that, that someone dropped. I mean, those are ordinary acts of kindness that, and politeness. Even non-believers do those things. There, there's nothing about those things that can only be explained by grace. The works of faith for which God predestined the believer fall into three basic categories. Obedience, responsibility, uh, responsibility, and opportunity. God calls every believer to faithful obedience. We must obey the clear and direct commands of the scriptures. And, and the Bible abounds with these, these commands. For example, Exodus 20, we see the Ten Commandments. They're not the Ten Suggestions, Ten Self-Help Steps, the Ten Commandments. Micah 6, 8. He has showed you, thee, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? Mark 12, Jesus said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And then he says in the next verse, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, we, we, these are easily understood commands. We don't need to make obedience complicated. We don't need to create our own rules so we don't break God's rules. We just need simple obedience. Obedience isn't a part-time matter when extenuating circumstances don't apply. Well, God, I didn't obey because of this. You know, you'll understand. No, God established laws that require complete and unqualified obedience. God wants obedience to be a lifestyle. The second category of works of faith is responsibility. Here's uh, an example from Scripture about responsibility. Uh, Proverbs 12, verse 18 says, There is that speaketh like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is help. Our, our, our words have power to destroy or to heal. We can't be reckless with our talk and then wonder why people are offended when we say something. Uh, we're responsible not just for what we say, but also how we say it. Also the effect that our words have. That's an example of a responsibility. It's not a direct command for us to obey. It's a principle to apply to our lives. It's, it's something for which we're responsible. We all have responsibilities in different spheres. We take care of family. You know, the believer's failure to take care of a family is outrageously grievous in the scriptures. We, we have responsibilities at work and at church. We have responsibilities to our community and to our nation. We must be careful not to shirk our responsibilities or to, or to shift blame for our failure to meet our responsibilities. And the third category of good works falls under opportunity. Galatians 6.10 says, As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Opportunities most often come as we fill our, fulfill our obedience and responsibilities. Think about David the shepherd boy for a moment. His father said, Go, watch the sheep. And so David obeyed. Now this was a big responsibility too. Wealth in those days was measured by livestock. The, the more livestock a person had, the wealthier they were. To lose even one sheep was like today, the, the stock market plunging a thousand points. David obeyed and he took his responsibility seriously. And a bear came along. And David wasn't looking for the bear, was he? He was just doing his thing. He was being responsible about it. Now there was an opportunity he was just obeying the father, watching the sheep, and he killed the bear with his bare hands. He wasn't a hired hand who would just 
run away when danger came. He took the responsibility to protect the sheep. He killed the bear with his bare hands. We have countless opportunities every day to show God that we're willing to obey and willing to fulfill our responsibilities. And when we feel like our head is about to explode because someone just acted like a jerk toward us, that's an opportunity to show love and kindness. Or at the very least, not to say what went through our minds. <laughs> Sometimes that's how you know the Holy Spirit's leading, right? Getting bad news is an opportunity to believe that God answers prayer, though not always at the time or the way we expect. We trust that in these situations, whatever we thought was good was not as good as what God had in store for us. We may not understand. We trust that God's all-wise, all-powerful love must move heaven and earth for our benefit. Our obedience, responsibilities, and opportunities are all evidences of faith. And Paul tells us about our works of faith in Titus 2 and, and 3. Uh, he said, Get, Jesus gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify to himself a peculiar people, zealous and enthusiastic of good works. They which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto all people. We were saved to do good works. And we must be zealous, enthusiastic about them. We must devote ourselves to the work of faith. How, how differently would the New Testament read if Jesus came to earth in a stable only to become a couch potato? How differently would our Bibles read if, if Jesus gave up this huge sigh as if he were put out every time somebody came to him for help. There's a reward for our faith. Paul tells us that everything a believer does, everything, will be tested in the white hot fire of God's holiness. And what we do for ourselves will be completely consumed with nothing to show for it. The works of faith will remain like gold and silver and precious stone. Jesus will look us in the face and he will say, well done. He'll rejoice in our works of faith. God predestined that we would become like Christ to do great works, but what does all that mean? How do, how do we obey the commands and fulfill the responsibilities so we have greater opportunities? How do we live like we were intended to live, to become like Christ? If not, I'll read quickly 31 and 32. So what shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all quantity and duration? In fact, he does more than we could ever expect or even possibly imagine. Amen. God will do what he will do, and we can't stop it. At first, that, that seems rather oppressive. I know that in me, it causes something to want to rise up and say, No! I want what I want! You ever been there? I want that! Take your imagination, if you would, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And you see Jesus kneeling there in prayer. And, and, and his gestures look like he's drowning. And his eyes look to heaven in what seems like desperation. His voice rises to near shouts and then falls to one moment his shoulders slump, and the next moment he's standing erect. And you move in close, and you hear him pray, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Did you hear that? Father, I want what you says of Jesus being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even unto death of the cross. Obedience is the only proper response to predestination. Christ modeled it for us and he gives us the grace to do it. He empowers us to obey his commands. Can you imagine what kind of God he would be if he said do this but made it impossible to 
we would worship God who put us in our round room and told us to sit in the corner. It would be an infinitely exasperating, humiliating, and hopeless thing. And salvation wouldn't be anything anyone would want under any circumstance. Obey what you know God has called you to do. Sometimes we, we know what we must do, but we don't always know how to do it. For, for example, God tells us to love others, and then in predestination, he puts a jerk in our life. How are we supposed to love that jerk? We may ask for wisdom. He'll give it. The point is that when we determine to obey, he'll guide us. He'll give us his spirit. He already gave us his word and the spiritual leaders in our lives to guide us. And he made this promise. Jesus said, if any man will know to do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Jesus basically said, anyone who determined to do God's will, follow God's predestined path for their lives. God will show that person what they need to do. When you don't know how to obey the clear commands of Scripture, ask for grace, the empowerment to do what you need to do, and for wisdom, to, to apply what you know of God and His Word in a practical way. God always answers that prayer. Sometimes Obedience just means doing the next thing. When you don't know what to do, determine what your next responsibility is. Maybe the next thing you need to do is to make dinner for the family. Uh, maybe it means to go to work or to go to the grocery store or to the, something at someplace else. Maybe it means to go to bed and get the rest you need so you can refresh and refocus. Do the next thing. The walk of faith happens just one step at a time. And as we obey faithfully, God changes us inwardly to be like Jesus. And since God's design for our lives is to make us like the Son, we must look at him. In, in John 4, we read of a conversation that Jesus had with the woman at the well. The woman, <coughs> pardon me, the woman left to go about her day, and the disciples said to Jesus, Eat, you must be hungry. Now what was Jesus' response? He said, My meat, my food, is to do the of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus came to do what the Trinity determined in eternity past, predestination. It was through Jesus' perfect submission to predestination that our redemption was accomplished. Think about that for a moment. That plan included the cross. And as gory and horrific and torturous as the crucifixion, that wasn't the worst part. The greatest part came when he cried out, Father, why have you abandoned me? And in that event, Jesus' path led through more suffering and agony than we could ever dare to imagine. Jesus knew all of the meaning of the cross with perfect understanding. And he still submitted to it because it was the only way that our, our redemption could Salvation was accomplished by God's all-wise, all-powerful, predestined love. God's plans are wiser than our own. And so it's best to trust the future to Him. And this is hard to do because sometimes life can be extremely frustrating and difficult. Think of a situation in your life right now that just looms the largest. Maybe it's a situation at work, a situation at church, maybe it's at home, maybe it's urgent. Maybe it's been going on for years with no end on the horizon. Maybe it's something that will pass before long. Maybe it's because your future is uncertain. Perhaps because of broken dreams that lie shattered at your feet. Think of the thing in which you take the most pride and joy. Maybe it's a promotion at work or some kind of accomplishment you had in your past. Maybe it's time with family. Maybe it's in a hobby. It can be any number of pleasant things. And all of these things are part of the path that we must walk. Though we might not choose some situations, we might choose others. And though some situations are forced on us through no fault of our own, the path that you walk is part of God's design for you. It's not so much that a pay raise as great as that might be, Time with family, as wonderful as that is, is what God planned for you. But how you choose to use that pay raise, that time with family, as you love and serve God. It's how those blessings and failures work together in unison to 
to change you to be like Jesus Christ in your character. You know, it's so easy to become discouraged during tough times when, when the novelty of success is long worn off. Sometimes you feel like you've, all you've done is just beat your head against a wall. It, it's common to think that nothing we do really does make a difference in the end, except maybe to just to torque someone even more, you know? I recently read a story of a missionary who left the mission field thinking he failed. He poured himself into the ministry with nothing to show for his efforts. Today, 80 years later, churches are thriving in that area because of the work he started. Another application that we make about predestination is that right now counts forever. Right now counts forever. We must reject our own wisdom. Wisdom that James tells us is earthly, sensational, and demonic. God's wisdom is pure, sincere, peaceable, gentle, easy to be reasoned with, full of mercy, resulting in good and eternal consequences. But sometimes, it, you have to admit, it feels like God is messing with. There, there's a particular situation I want so badly I can taste it. I'm working hard to make it happen as far as I can without presuming on God through rash decisions. Yet at every turn, God removes that particular avenue of opportunity. It almost feels like God's up there in heaven. He nudges an angel. He goes, I'm just going to mess with Matt here a little bit. Watch. You know, God's love is not fickle or is it His love is all wise and all powerful. And my response to that love, my decisions, my attitudes, my emotions, my thoughts, my words, my actions have eternal consequences. Let me say it differently. What I do right now matters forever. It matters because it reveals whether or not I trust God's plans for me. Mm -hmm. Your responsibility, or your responses rather, especially in the things that you don't want or don't like, or the things that make you angry, reveal whether you trust God or not. What is it that makes you angry? What is it that makes you angriest? Uh, what, what does that matter threaten? It, it probably threatens something that you want. Does what you want align with what God wants? Will what you ch want change you to be more like Christ? If your responses are merciless and unfair and unkind and unloving and bitter, you aren't becoming like Christ. If your responses are loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, faithful, gentle, show self-control and build up the people around you, you're changing to be. So how would you characterize your spirit right now? Would someone who knows you well say that you showed Christ's character or not? What does God's predestination mean for those who have not yet believed on Jesus for salvation? As I mentioned in the illustration, sometimes it seems like predestination comes across as this pickup game on an elementary school playground. Predestination means that God chose that all who would believe on his son would be saved. How does this happen? It happens because Jesus was the only person ever to do the Father's will completely and perfectly. Yes. Romans 5.18 Therefore, as by one offense of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. This verse very simply means that Adam's one act of sin punched all of humanity under the curse of God's wrath on our sins. Jesus' one act of perfect obedience, the obedience that led him to the cross, offers redemption for all who believe. No plans of ours could ever redeem us. We could create whatever plan we want for our redemption. We might say that we live by our own code, and we faithfully stick to it. We might do good things. A while back, a, a young woman told Lee that, that she was a spirit, that this young woman thought of herself as a spiritual master. She meant that he had, she had her spiritual life under control. She determined her own eternal destiny, but unfortunately it had nothing to do with God's predestination. Whatever plan we have for ourselves is not, not God's plan of redemption. Jesus did for us what we could not and would not do for ourselves. According to a plan chosen before the foundation of the world, Jesus died in our place to 
bear God's wrath on our sins so that we might enjoy the blessings of eternal life. True. All we must do to enjoy fellowship with God is to believe in Jesus only. Mm -hmm. If you're here today, you're listening online, you've never placed your faith in Jesus alone, I invite you to do so right now. Uh, maybe it, it just seems too simple, maybe there's questions that arise in your mind, Please feel free to talk to me or someone else here today, but we'll be glad to show you from the Bible what God has to say to you. As we close, imagine going to your spouse, your parent, your best friend, and saying, hey, let me tell you all about my day. And you start talking, but it's obvious they aren't listening. And if that happened several times in a row, you'd wonder if that person really cared. God's predestined love for you concerns and includes the details of every moment of every day. He allows us to walk a path through both plain and, uh, pain and pleasure, not so that we will think blessings are tangible and pain is punishment, so that he, but so that he will shape us to be like Jesus. What you're going through right now is part of the plan that God has for your life. God also predetermined the choices you have. You either walk by faith or you reject his will. You may apply his grace to our lives to do whatever is impossible to do otherwise, to obey him no matter what. We may trust that his all-wise, all-powerful love exerts all of its attention and effort on us so that we will be everything he promised. And this gives confidence that I matter to God. And that, that he hasn't given up on me. And in response to such love, we will dedicate our lives to pursue God's purpose for our lives. And may the Lord give us the grace to hear and to do his word. Let us pray. In the silence of the next few moments, I, I invite you to consider your faith. Are you trusting him right now? in the middle of that great problem in your life, or in the middle of that great success, or, or even in the middle of life's normalness. Allow the Holy Spirit to continue to speak to your hearts. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence this morning in awe. We make plans for tomorrow that disappear like our breath on a cold winter morning. But your plans remain firm and faithful through all eternity. With all wise, all powerful love, you gave us the very best when you sent Jesus Christ to live a perfect life, to die a perfect death, and to rise again in perfection. We ask in his name for you to hear and to answer. Maybe someone here today, maybe watching online, who has never believed only in Jesus. They've done good things and they've trusted those good things, but they've never placed faith in Jesus alone. And may today be the day when they become included in your plan to bring all of creation into harmony with you. May today be the day of their salvation. Lord, we as believers confess that we often take our eyes off eternity. Things of yesterday and today distract us. We fail to realize that you're doing more things in each of us than we could ever imagine. Help us to trust you fully so that we may obey you perfectly. We want to be like Jesus. We love you. Amen. Let's all stand. Church, page 325.
Hebrews 13, Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Amen.